let's start talking about these, these allegories. So this is the beginning at the end of book six of the Republic. Um, Plato presents us with um, two allegories to start with. Um, one being the allegory of the line, or the simile of the line, or the analogy of the line. Forget how it's specifically referred to in the book. Um, and the other one is the analogy or the simile of the sun. So the line and the sun are the first two of these. And then these are sort of followed up with the uh, more well-known allegory of the cave. Um, so before we jump into these, I want to cover briefly some very uh, basic distinctions that we've talked about before, but I want to uh, emphasize, re-emphasize for the sake of clarifying especially the line. So the first thing. What's that? A cloth? What's under the cloth? I don't know. A pencil. Incorrect. Kind of correct. I cannot see. You can't. It's correct. You can't see what's under the cloth. That was intentional. <laughs> I was going to say the desktop. That's true. Or the desktop. Not, what I was, not entirely under the cloth, so I was careful. What if I would have guessed it right? No one, probably. And that's, well, I would, I put it under there. But that's the point. That, that's the point I want to draw. Right. draw our, I want to draw our attention to the point that, yeah, no one knows what's under there. However, if I were to say there is, in fact, something under there, is that true? Maybe. You could be lying. Yeah. There is, in fact, something under there? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, assuming I didn't do something clever with something in my hand, we can all know, based on what we know, that there is something under there, even if we don't know what it is. So this is a distinction, uh, we've, uh, like I said, I've mentioned this before, uh, between metaphysics and epistemology. OK, what are these two things, metaphysics and epistemology? They're areas of study, but about what? The study of reality, study of the world, the, precisely speaking, it's the study of what is, what's real. So what really exists, in what way do things exist, etc. This has been a lot of what we've been talking about in this class. Okay, what about epistemology? What's that? It's like, it's hard to explain, it's kind of like the idea, like, you, you see an object and the object, is like, it either shows itself to you in your mind or like your mind sees the object. Therefore, the object is. Like where, just, where are you getting this? Where is like the. Um, this like, sounds Heideggerian. Yeah, well, it was for my. There you go. Okay. I figured. Okay, so epistemology, broadly speaking, <coughs> is the study of how we know things and what we know. So that can be things like observation, how we observe an object, how the thing reveals itself to us, and to use existentialist language for it. But broadly speaking, epistemology, contrasted with metaphysics, is the study of what we know and how we know it. Now, there is a metaphysical fact to do with what is under that handkerchief. Right? There is something there. If I were to say what it was, what I said would be true. But there's a difference between it being there and you knowing what's there. So there's another example. Is there intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? Say, outside the solar system. Okay, so there's two possible answers to this. Yes and no. No. There's an epistemological answer and there's a metaphysical answer. The epistemological answer we know. We know the answer to the epistemological question. The answer is I don't know. And that is a full answer that's the best we can give, probably, unless we believe certain alien encounter story. Generally, though, we can accept I don't know as an answer to the epistemological question. In other words, the question of do we know that there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? We don't know. The metaphysical question, well, we just said we don't know the answer to it, but there still is an answer regardless of whether we know that answer. Mm -hmm. Just like there is an answer to the question, what's under that handkerchief, even though we don't know what the answer is. OK, further example. What was under the handkerchief? Uh, actually, oh, I'm sorry, just, question. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, and you didn't see it. I can just clarify the two terms again. Yeah, so metaphysics is what's true. Epistemology is what we know. It's the shortest possible explanation we can give. 
Uh, broadly speaking, metaphysics is the study of reality and what's real. And epistemology is the study of what we know and how we know it. Yeah. Wait, so what would uh, metaphysics say about like life? Like, well, that there is a determinate answer, but we don't know what it is. So pretty much right. like that's like a yes or no answer. Mm -hmm. And this is like possible answers. In yeah, this is to do with our knowledge of what's mm -hmm. going on. This is to do with what's actually going on. Suppose there are really aliens uh, somewhere in the Alpha Centauri system. They're really there. They're tall, they're blue, they can plug their hair into things. <laughs> I'm talking about Avatar. Um, they're really there, we just don't know that. Right? They're, they're really there. Right? Just like before we knew anything about it, the pipe was under the handkerchief. Right? It's, it was there all along. Me taking the handkerchief that was blocking it away, all that did was it, it allowed us to know something new, even though the fact of the matter had been that case, been the case all along. Right? This was there the whole time. So from when I put it there, metaphysically speaking, it was a fact that this was under the handkerchief on the desk. Even if we didn't know it at the time. So if I had asked you, is there a pipe under the handkerchief five minutes ago? And you said yes, you would have said something true, even if you didn't know it. Just like supposing there are real aliens out there, and I were to say yes, aliens exist, I would say something true, even if I don't know that that's true, and even if I have no reason for thinking it's true. Maybe I shouldn't say it solidly, but yes, and then yes. I was going to say, that's what you mean when you say it's metaphysical? Hmm? Okay. Metaphysical is what actually is. Okay. Right? So it actually was the case that this was under the handkerchief. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with the aliens example, if we don't know, then like, how do we answer the other? Like, I'm just confused. We can't answer it. We can't. Right. We can't answer it. But there is an answer. It's just an answer we don't know about. So what was the answer? I don't know. <laughs> You'd have to ask someone who knows. <laughs> See, this is the problem, right? There is an issue with connecting these two. Uh, and it's the problem, essentially, is that they don't always connect. Right? We don't always know everything, obviously. There's a lot of things that none of us know, but there's still a fact of the matter. It's still true. We just find out that it's true when we learn something new, right? Is he saying we don't know what if there are aliens? Isn't that epistemological? Right, so we can only, in this case, in a case where we don't know the answer, we can give an answer to this question. Oh, okay, okay. The epistemological question. But we can't give the answer to the metaphysical question simply because our answer to this is I don't know. So these are two different ways of looking at any given question. Um, what are you going to have for lunch tomorrow? Food. Cool. Okay, who has decided? Okay, who has not decided what you're going to have for lunch tomorrow? Great. What are you going to have for lunch tomorrow? Me? Yeah. I don't know yet. That's an answer to this kind of question. But you will eat something. And when you do, so that's like what is real. yeah, and that's what's real, right? Okay. The reality is what you're actually going to eat, tomorrow, even if you don't know yet. Okay. Okay. Clear enough distinction. Keep this in mind. We're going to come back to it when we look at especially um, the algorithm line. Okay. Another question. What's this? <coughs> Pipe? Does no one read French? I do. This is not a pipe. Now why does it say that? <laughs> it doesn't seem plausible. They look similar. It's a picture of a pipe. Okay. No. Why does that make it not a pipe? Good answer. Explain. Um, well, it's calling to make sure the, the object itself, the, mm -hmm. the image, rather than mm -hmm. what it's depicting. So yeah. the reality of what you're looking at. Right. So. These two things are different, right? Mm -hmm. What makes these different? This picture, one's not. This is a real thing. This is a picture of a real thing. It's a depiction of it. It's an image. One way of thinking about this as well, which is a better pipe? One in holding. Correct. This one functions. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thinking back to remember when we were talking about what is a sandwich? Right. Great example. Hold on. 
No. I'm not getting into this. All right, let's go with, uh, what the heck? There's directions with a perfect, I should start using Bing. Um, here we go. No one ever. Okay, fair enough. All right, which is a better sandwich, this or the one you're holding? That's a wrap. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. Fair enough. A sandwich is any meat between two pieces of bread or one large piece of bread. Again. One large piece of bread. A wrap is essentially bread. It's a wrap. The hoagie a sandwich? Yes. No, not starting this. Sandwich is a hoagie. All right. So. It would have to by your screen. What? The meat is sandwiched inside the tortilla. All right, so <laughs> let's hold off on this. And if we have way too much time to kill at the end of the semester, let's get into what is a sandwich. Uh, for now, assuming that wraps are sandwiches, which is better. That and this. The one there. All right. Well, I mean, you're hesitating. Why are you hesitating? Somebody hesitated. Were you not sure? Somebody was. But that's actually a wrap. Well, as a sandwich, it's easy to eat, so I'm going for that. Okay. I can't eat that one. I physically cannot eat that one. It's a picture. Anybody want to try? True. No, no, let's not. I'm going to ask for volunteers later. Not for this. No, we're not going to try and eat the pixels, uh, the light that is reflected off of the whiteboard. No. Um, right. But you see my point, right? That's not a sandwich. Even if that's not a sandwich either, it's closer. <laughs> I, <laughs> everyone watch or eat. It's great. Um, in any case, so, but the point is, right? So even if a wrap isn't a sandwich, it's closer to being a sandwich than a picture on a whiteboard, as that does sandwichy things, so to speak, right? That does what a sandwich is supposed to do. Be eaten. It, yeah, it's for eating. Exactly. That's exactly right. A sandwich is food. That's not. That's closer to reality. In fact, it's, it is reality, right? This is an entirely different distinction than metaphysics and epistemology, but this is what is, so this is a metaphysical question, with respect to the same kind of thing, right? That is relevantly similar to that. Just like that is relevantly similar to this, but this one's more real. Metaphysically, this is higher on a scale of being than that one. Further question. How do you know what this is? You told me. Did I? I did? Well, I did. You're right. <laughs> Before I said it's a pipe. <laughs> how, did, how do you know what this is? Someone else told me. Really? <laughs> Fair enough, but what, what specifically? What kind of previous knowledge? What Seems do you need to know? Use it. Not use it. Okay, so you gotta know what, you've gotta have some experience with it. You gotta understand something about the shape of it. Well, not this specifically. Has anyone seen me smoke this pipe? No. no. Then you don't have experience with it, strictly speaking. With that specific one. Right. You have experience with pipes, maybe, in general. So you have an idea of what pipes are. So that's important. You have to have some kind of understanding about it. And you match it to, well, this little thing, which is shaped in a certain way, which has certain qualities to it, looks like that kind of thing that's in my mind, the pipe. So yeah, that's what that must be. OK. So we also, so, we, so part of this process is knowing what pipes are. Right? Some, some contact with this idea, and whereas Plato might say this form of what a pipe is. Okay. Then what else do you need? You have to have this idea. Then what? Know the shape of pipe. That's part of knowing the idea, though. Oh, okay. but then what do you need to know that this is a pipe? Some sense of what a pipe is, like beyond just the idea. Well, we kind of got that. Because the idea can be like, it can be a different shape, it can be a different type of thing. True, but once we have the idea, how do we match it to a thing? How do we match this idea and attributes about it? Is it as simple as just seeing it? Yeah, you, you gotta see it. See it? You gotta see it. Usually the answers to these questions are painfully obvious, by the way, uh, especially today. You see it. How does that work, roughly speaking? What do you need to be able to see this thing? Eyes. Eyes. You need eyes. Light. Light. And? Consciousness. Sight. 
Instead, that's in the eyes, so to speak. <laughs> Consciousness is behind the eyes, so to speak, if you will. What else? Also behind the eyes. But this part of the visual apparatus, roughly speaking. What else do you need? Thank you. The pipe. Right? Because, watch this. Everybody in this room has eyes, light, and consciousness, and can no longer see a pipe. You still know it's there, though. You know it's there. Based on memory. That's important. But you need three things. You need... You use different colors. Sight, light, and... Yeah, so you need... Sight... The ability to see, so you need an eye. Are you actually drawing? Poorly. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't get the idea that this is going to be competent. Do the actual thing. It's not actually bad. Could be worse. And you need light, which Plato depicts as the sun. Because he didn't have light before. The sun or a light source. So, the light of the sun or some light source is what allows us to see things using our sight. You need the thing, you need the thing seeing, and you need the light to illuminate it. Okay, so what about the idea of a pipe? How do you know what that is? What do you need? Someone else has to know what it is to explain it to me. Hmm. Maybe. Necessarily. What was your question? Again? How do you know what a pipe is in the abstract? This idea or this form of a pipe, so the idea in our minds, not the actual physical particular thing. How do we know what that is? How do we understand that? Like, maybe like the function? Because like that could be like, you could use that as not a pipe, like if it doesn't actually do so, its purpose, then it could be something else. So the function, the function as far as the idea of it goes, is like the stem of the pipe. Right? It's a piece of it. It's part of the concept. By someone showing it to us? So showing you this? Yeah. Someone actually. If I just kind of hold this up and no one has any idea what a pipe is, uh, it'd be hard to see, like, the hold. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, there's actually a, um, there's a, there's a short film about the ages from quite some time ago called The God Must Be Crazy. Uh, a significant, uh, significant part of it is a, uh, an uncontacted tribe somewhere uh, has a, uh, a, a Coca-Cola bottle fall out of the sky like, from delivery truck. No one knows what the heck it's for, right? Because it's, it's a bottle. Okay, so they use it for all sorts of things, right? They use it as a tool, they use it to carry liquid like it's supposed to be used for. But no one had any concept of it holding soda because no one had any concept of soda. So when something, a particular little thing, happens into your field of vision, say, or even happens into your interactions with it, and you're able to interact with it, and you're able to try and figure it out, there's more to finding the concept, there's more to understanding the concept, than picking up a particular thing and examining it. Mm -hmm. What about things we can't see? Further, really good point. How do we know what justice is? Have several thought experiments. Yeah, well, you use thought experiments. You try and think it through. My point is, Plato's point is, the concepts are analogous to particular things in an important way. In that you need the concept, you need your ability to understand, or your understanding, and you need truth. The concept has to be true in order for you to grasp it. And you have to be capable of grasping it, and the concept has to actually exist in some way. So, this is his analogy of the sun. So he talks about the eye, or our vision, being analogous to understanding. <laughs> He talks about the thing that we see as being analogous to the form. Something that we understand. And he talks about the sun or the light source as being analogous to truth. 
the things that we see? The forms, yeah. oh. or a form, or, an, or a concept, you can call it. So in order to understand something, you have to understand what truth is, the concept of something being true. There has to be something true about it, and you have to have some capacity for understanding. Just like in order to see a particular physical thing, the thing has to be there, there has to be some kind of light, and you have to be able to see. It works the same way, at least according to Plato. Now, there are minor differences, obviously. You can't see justice. You can understand it. You can understand what, is, what are pipes, what is a pipe, what pipes are. So this is an analogous way for us to think of how we understand things. Because how we understand things is a very difficult topic. To be able to, uh, under, to, be able to understand how we understand First of all, it encounters the sort of self-referential problem. You have to, you're having to examine yourself using the faculty that you already understand things with. It's the whole taking your eyes out to look at them problem. How do you know what color your eyes are problem. It was a bigger problem before <coughs> mirrors were common, especially glass mirrors. Then there's also the issue of, well, understanding is not something we can see, and not something we can take apart and examine. And even with, even with, say, modern neuroscience, we can't pick apart understanding. We can look at the mechanism and see what parts move where and what does what functionally, but that doesn't really help us to see, all right, how do we understand abstract concepts? How do we abstract from this thing in my hand to this is a pipe to pipes are for smoking, and then further to, okay, what is a pipe? abstractly, understanding pipes, being able to identify different things, etc. So this chain of being and chain of understanding is, this leads us to this next analogy. So I'm going to, this is the analogy of the sun. This leads us to our, our next analogy, where he tells us to draw a line. Draw a straight line, then divide it unevenly. Okay, divide it unevenly. Then he says to divide each segment unevenly along the same ratio. So. Same ratio. Divided it into thirds, divided this into thirds, and divided this into thirds, in case you're following along. This is the easiest way of keeping track of this. That's why I brought a your stick. Yard stick? Yeah. So, and he says we can use this line and the divisions along this line to look at different kinds of things we can understand and different ways we have of understanding. reason I drew it right here is because there is the metaphysical question, what actually is, and the epistemological question, which is how we know about it or how we come into contact with it, how our understanding comes into contact with it. So, how does he divide this thing? We've got our first division is into the top half and the bottom half. What are these two divisions? 
What's the top first, the large division of the line, and what's the smaller division of the line? If you're following along the analogies on 508 and forward. So it's these two segments and these two segments. And the understanding is not the top one? Mm -hmm. So, particularly, um, this segment is understanding and this segment is thought. But we haven't gotten there yet. What is the section as a whole? Top half. Okay. The top half is what he refers to as the intelligible. And the bottom half is what he refers to as the sensible. So understanding and thought are the two parts of the intelligible. What are the two parts of the sensible? Or the bottom two? Emotion and imagination. Belief. And imagination. OK. And we have our line divided. OK. Why is this intelligible and why is this sensible? What's the difference between intelligible and sensible? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to have uh, kind of like a grasp of our senses, right? That's kind of what the whole experiment is. is. So our, our intelligible, which is like our reason, mm -hmm. should come over our like sense, my, our sensory responses. So yes, though you're making it broader than it needs to be. So yes, your intelligible, the, the intelligible parts of us, the intellectual parts, are supposed to take precedence over and have control over the sensory parts. But the distinction is particularly to do with, well, a chain of being, a chain of understanding. Mm -hmm. Does this feel like theoretical and practical wisdom? All of this has to do with theoretical wisdom. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you would, you would think a nice, convenient place to divide this would be theoretical, practical. Okay. Not quite. Um, all of this has to do with theoretical propositions. But you probably could apply a similar structure to practical propositions as well. Um, but Plato doesn't here, and I'm probably not going to get into that, um, unless we have lots of spare time, which is likely. Um, but all of this is theoretical wisdom, theoretical understanding, theoretical reason. Okay, so intelligible is, if we're using our other analogy, what's the intelligible over here? Our state. What do you mean? What's well, things that we've practically observed and can reason? Yeah. So where's the division between intelligible and sensible? Wouldn't form be sensible? How so? <clears throat> if you look at a stick, you know, you'd say, okay, that stick can be used for this. Uh, it could also be used for this. My reason tells me I can use it as a lever. Uh, the shape of it indicates that it would make a good lever. Not exactly. Not exactly. It makes up both. How so? It is both. But in what way? Well, I feel like intelligible, you would, like you would recognize the form. Mm -hmm. And then sensible, in a way, you know, you know this associated form is true to what it does. Not just to what it does, but to a particular thing. OK, so the distinction with the pipe, the thing that you see, this, is sensible. You can sense it. Well, you're kind of sensitive, right? You can see it. You can hear it. If I smoked it, you could smell it. If you came up and touched it, you could touch it. I'm not encouraging you to taste it. But the form or the concept is intelligible. 
It's something that you contact with your understanding, you grasp with your understanding, instead of with your sight, with your five senses. It's an idea that you have to grasp with your mind, with your intellect, hence it being intelligible as opposed to sensible. So sensible things are things that you can see, you can touch, you can hear, etc. So intelligible was? Things that you understand, things that you think about, concepts. So if I were to say, what is this for? I've already answered it. What is this for? Smoke? Yeah, this is for smoking tobacco. Right. Great. That's intelligible. Why is that not sensible? <coughs> Why is that bit of information? Why is that intelligible rather than sensible? It's not something you can see and hear like it in the house. Right. Or uh, your five senses. It's just something it's not you know. immediately. It's, 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 that's important, right? Not immediately. You know what it's for because you've seen it happen before, sure. But it's not something you're observing at the moment. This is something that we know about things like this, this kind of thing. And kinds of things are intelligible. Relations between kinds of things are intelligible. The actual thing itself, that's sensible, right? Because you can sense it, you can see it right here. Is it like we're saying what it does, not what it is? Well, what it is and what it does are both intelligible. It, okay. it is sensible, right? this. Or, you know, this. So, the sun, light, is to the sensible what truth is. We see, th we see things because there's light that illuminates things. We understand things because they're true. So what about these finer distinctions? Using the same analogy, we were talking about the sensible thing. So this, this little bit of particular. What's something that I say, imagine about this, as opposed to believe by Plato's definitions here? Picture? Yeah. That different from this. That is an object of the imagination. This is an object of belief. Why is it different? Depiction is imagined. Mm -hmm. Representation is belief. Yeah, so depiction is just of something real, particular. It's a reflection of it. It's like a shadow of it. Or if I were to do that, that, the shadow, is an image of the real thing. So, the, oops, turn this off. On the epistemological side, we have belief and imagination. These are the faculties that we have that allow us to grasp things, that allow us to wrap our minds around them, so to speak. <coughs> Those objects, the objects that we grasp with imagination are images, broadly speaking. Images, imitations of real things. Things that are about real things but aren't themselves real, like pictures and the like. Pictures, reflections, shadows, stories, anything like that. That's an image. That's the object of our imagination. Belief is about particular objects. Particular real objects. I put quotes around real, because Plato is going to say that this stuff is more real. But how we ordinarily use real, this, this is real, your sandwich was real. Wrap, the wrap was real, whatever. Okay, so what about the intelligible? What about this? Is, oh, sorry, question? No. Oh, do you want to try and answer? What about this is the object of thought? What about this is the object of understanding? Like, understanding what is used for? Like, you have that understanding, like, it is used to smoke, it is used for smoking tobacco, almost? That's tough, though. 
Not necessarily. That's actually more like the, the domain of thought. The domain of understanding is what this is. It's a pipe. Insofar as what it's used for is part of what it is, and it's part of understanding, but it's only a part of it. Right? The what it is is the part that belongs to understanding, so the form, the concept. The particular relationship between this and, say, you know, these three things, right? None of which are probably allowed on this campus, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> I have yet to light this with one of the no smoking posters, but I'm very close. Um, in any case, right? the relationship between these things, right? What's this for? This is for smoking this, and you use these to light it, right? Knowing what, that these things work together in a certain way. Oh, uh, evidence. <laughs> I'm recording this. <laughs> I don't care who knows. I, <laughs> everyone knows that everyone breaks that rule. I thought, I thought that was common knowledge. Um, you just go in your bathroom in the dorm and... What? I didn't hear that. <laughs> the camera didn't hear it either. You turned the shower on. Um, <laughs> as a side note, um, when they... Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked, but it's important. As soon as they passed the uh, the, the, the tobacco-free campus thing, as soon as there was like wind, when I was getting wind of hearing that this was going to happen, I was like, yeah, this is going to be awful. Oh my god, it's bad. It's so bad. So bad. The library. Yeah, so the library, just cigarettes. any <laughs> given stairwell <laughs> is going to be full of butts. <laughs> Nothing but butts, just the, the entire floor of every stairwell on campus. And it has been, so I, you know, that's just awful, but but predictable. <coughs> anyway, that's not the point. point is, knowing that these things are related, right, that they work together in certain ways, right, knowing one thing is for the use of another thing, say. Knowing how different concepts or different forms cooperate, act together, how they compare. Or knowing that this particular object instantiates a particular form, right, knowing that this is a pipe. Not just knowing like, that this thing's here, right? not just seeing it, but knowing what it is, is a relationship between the form and the particular thing. Knowing that pipes are for smoking tobacco, this kind at least, legal in some place, calm down. Um, <laughs> knowing that pipes are for smoking tobacco is a relationship between forms or concepts. Right? So thought has to do with relationships relations, or mathematics. Because mathematics is just knowing how things relate to one another numerically. Knowing that, say, there are three matches in my hand is knowing what the particular relationship between these things is, <coughs> for example. Same goes for any kind of mathematics. So we see here that we have different ways of knowing things, epistemological side. We have understanding, thought, belief, and imagination. These two being intellectual, these two being sensory. And we have different things that are known, different things that are understood, different things that exist. And they exist in different ways and to different degrees. Just like our knowledge over here is to different degrees of certainty and scope. Right. Knowing, for instance, that this is not a pipe, or looking at this and watching it, watching it on the screen, even less so, right? That's imagination. That is our lowest level of understanding, lowest level of knowledge here. Seeing this thing here and actually seeing it, that's a step up. We believe that it's there. Knowing what it is, knowing that this is a pipe, and expecting it to be lit, say, that's thought, that's thinking about it. That's a step up, and that's more broad. That's understanding that, or that's thinking about what this is for, what it does, how it interacts with things. Then knowing 
about what pipes are in general, that is our highest level of knowledge because that extends to all things of a certain kind. If you know what pipes are in general, you can say, for instance, why this one is better than the one on the screen. One other note for Plato. As you go up to this scale, things become more real. Because they're true of more things, they're more importantly or more broadly true. So knowing about forms, understanding forms, or understanding concepts, is closer to truth than knowing the relationships between things. It's closer to truth than being aware of the things around you. It's much closer to truth than, say, like watching a movie that imitates reality seeing a picture that imitates reality. So the farther up you go on here, the closer you are to reality. So. Putting these two analogies together. You need light or things that allow for our perceptual capacities to believe and to imagine. You know, our, our senses need to be functioning in some way in order to believe or to imagine. To be able to think and to understand, <clears throat> our intellectual capacities have to be functioning, and we need truth. There needs to be truth. So. The top of this line is what? Absolute truth. Truth. Big T truth, so to speak. On the epistemological side, at least. What about on the metaphysical side? Something is more <laughs> real. Some things are more real, less real. And they're more real in relation to what? Not even at all, actually. A concept isn't physically present, but it's more real than the thing it's a concept of. So it's true of broader, more things. It's true in a more robust sense than the pipe on the table. Knowledge? <coughs> kind of. It's still more epistemological. Knowledge, ultimate truth. But you're right, in a sense. We would say it's being, or reality, or existence, particularly being. Being is typically the word used for them. But you're right that they're the same thing. But they're answers to they're answers about the same thing to different kinds of questions. <clears throat> what is true and what is real? You're asking the same thing, just in a different way. In the one case, you're asking the epistemological question, what's true? In the other case, you're asking the, the metaphysical question, what's real? In both cases, what Plato puts at the top of the line is the good. Being, truth, and goodness are all the same thing considered in different ways. Goodness is considered in its own right. If something is better if it's more true. It's better if, it's more, if it exists more fully. It's more true if, we can, if, it, if it's a bit of knowledge that applies to more things, if it applies more fully. It's more real if it exists in a more robust kind of a way. So what about like mm -hmm. when we're creating inventions it starts with an idea and imagination and it goes all the way until it's a... Depends how you mean about creating an invention. Well, for example... Well, it depends on, well, let, me, let me rephrase that. It depends on, on, on how we describe the process. So, give me an example. I'll see if I can work with it. The phone. Okay. Like, yeah. decades ago, it was the imagination. 
Yeah, so the telephone, um, 100 years ago. Let's just say, to be safe, 200 years ago. But actually, um, yeah, that one doesn't help in the 1800s. I could be totally wrong about that, if anyone knows or knows. But, um, let's just say 200 years ago, just to be safe. Right? The ability to communicate um, over wires or wirelessly or from far distances, farther than you can shout, right? That was, we can say, only imaginary. But is it? Is it imaginary in this sense? Plato would say no. If Plato had the idea of telephony, right, being able to speak across far distances, presumably with the aid of technology or whatever, right, you wouldn't call that imagination. Why? Because the form of communication so wouldn't be belief. It wouldn't be belief because it doesn't. It's not particularized. There's no way of doing it. So it couldn't be belief. Is it, is, is, I feel like I'm going to answer this completely wrong, right? But I feel like you can make it, since in a sense of you can make it happen, right? Mm -hmm. like or if you were, hypothetically at least. We know that you can, but he might not have known. He probably wouldn't have known this was possible, but yeah, go on. I think you're right, so continue. I think at least. I haven't thought this like, fully through. <laughs> working this out. Like, um, for example, like creating a, a cell phone, right? In order to create something in general, you have to have some type of image or vision behind it to then figure out how to make that thing or thought or belief or so yes reality. so so yes so you have to have some kind of image or thought about it in order to instantiate it in order to make the real thing but what do we mean image do we mean an image like this kind of image or do we mean a thought like this kind of thought or do we have a form in mind you need which is all it? three because mm -hmm. yeah I can All tell right. you how. Here, counter example. I can tell you. Okay. Counter example. Hold on. Yeah, this is going to be good. All right. So here's. That's not at all what I was looking for. So can I defend my statement? Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> but like, here's my here's my thought. Right. This was an image. What is, what is that? That's a Star Trek communicator. This was an image of what, that's an image of what a cell phone was going to look like from 60 years ago. Yeah. This was what we thought of, what we saw, the image in our minds, right? The, the imitation of reality, that we, or what we thought would imitate reality for how to communicate over long distances. But it's not quite right. So, yeah. Or so on. Think about the things that got accidentally invented. True. I was an accident. I got accidentally invented. That's not. <laughs> that's an entirely different kind of thing. But um. That's creation. So check, check the getting. Perfectly. I got this. Right? Precise. Yeah. yeah so, go, ahead, go ahead. So a cell phone, right? This uh -huh. is what we're talking about. <laughs> you have to have an understanding of what technology is in order to make that cell phone. Uh -huh. You have to have the thought of how to create it, and you have to have the image that coincides with the thought in order to create it. Because so, you can't create a cell phone that looks like a circle. He was like, hey, I that's think you could. You could. So I think you're mostly right. So I think you're mostly right. So you have to have an understanding of the things involved. Right? You have to understand understanding of circuitry. You have to understanding of, of telephones already, if you're going to make a cell phone. Right? You have to have an understanding of the various technologies involved. But that you also have to have thought. You have to think about how they relate to each other in a novel way. Right. So this is, I think, our relations, is where most of the work is getting done in invention. And then the image comes later. The image comes with, all right, here's how it's going to work. Here's what it's going to do. Let's put it together, and then we know what it looks like. Because, I mean, we were, Roddenberry at least, was close-ish, but not really, right? There's substantial differences here. There's, there's, there's issues with this being the image of, of wireless telephony, right? 
because it was based off of you know relating concepts together or relating probably relating objects together. Let's look at a phone and let's look at a, a walkie-talkie and let's look at a radio and put those together or something like that. Right? Yeah. If you're well, if you're gonna like create something, you could have an image of it in your mind of what you think it's gonna turn out mm -hmm. to be, even if it's not like after you put it together, it may not turn out how you originally imagined it to look like. But you don't really need that. Well, okay, so you don't need it. You don't need it, which is which is important, but you can have it. I think it's important that you can have it. There's something else to notice here. First of all, there's a reason why he has it divided unevenly. First of all, because <clears throat> the intelligible he thinks is more important and more real than the sensible. But then there's another reason why he has it divided unevenly again in the same proportion. It's because he thinks this reflects this. This is, is in some way an imitation of this. Or it's, and then further on, right, imagination is a reflection of belief. That one's fairly clear, right? So, great example, I think. So if we go like, let's go back to our pipe. Right? When I say that this is an image of this, what I mean is it looks like it. If I want to get even more literal, if I put it out here, and I can say the shadow is an image of it in a more direct sense. It's an imitation of it in a very direct way. So each part reflects the parts above it. Something else to notice, which is neat, just mathematically speaking, and I don't know exactly what to make of this, but, um, that these two, thought and belief, are the same size. These are the same length, as long as you do the divisions right. It's three feet long. Each segment is supposed to be eight inches, each of these two. Yeah. It's supposed to work. That's why I screwed up initially. And it's something like, it probably has something to do with that, you know, uh, particular objects, real objects, don't reflect relationships. They reflect concepts. Okay. Hence these two being the same size. They're not like a, one isn't a, a shadow of the other or an imitation of the other. They're the same. They're both an imitation of forms or an instantiation or a reflection of form. So you can't say that, that objects are reflections of relationships or instantiations or imitations of relationships. But you can say that images are reflections or imitations of belief. The lower part that reflects the higher part. And images are reflections of relationships. They're like relationships in a way. So the image is related to the object like the object is related to the form. Relationships are imitations in a sense of forms. Relationships are the way forms work together, or the way objects interact with forms. They're instantiations of forms. They're related in some way. So in a sense, these two kind of work together as a middle ground say something like that. But in general, lower things are reflections of higher things, or imitations of So it's have something lower on the scale, so it's an image. What it is for it to be an image is for it to be a reflection of a real thing. Okay, so another another kind of outlandish example. Does everyone know what a narwhal is? Does anyone not? A what? Narwhal. Okay, so it's like a it's like um, you know what unicorns are. Yeah. It's like a whale unicorn. Oh. It's like a whale, but it has a big horn. Um, so raise your hand if you think those are you think narwhals are real. Okay, raise your hand if you think they're mythological or made up. Okay, great. They look like this. They're real. Um, if you didn't know that, they're neat. Um, 
Very, there's, this is an image of it. But those of us who, or maybe before you found out that these things were real and you just heard about it, you might have thought they were imaginary. So what do we make of imaginary things? It was just images? But images of what? What is a unicorn an image of? Because it's not real, it's not a particular thing. Maybe. Let's say yes, just hypothetically. <coughs> Unicorns have to be some pastel color, at least. There we go. <laughs> may or may not be magical. What's it an image of, if it is just imaginary? Yeah. Wait, are you trying to like relate this to the reflections of... Yeah. Okay, so is it like, it's not, it's like a concept in its own way, even though, even though it's not real? Imagination. So I wouldn't say it's a concept. But I don't know. Like, it's hard I was, to say it's a concept. I'm trying to find like a synonym then, for it. Then it's more real than real things. But yeah. like, do you know what I mean by concept? Yeah. So it's an idea in a sense. Yeah. So I think we can say, yeah, it's intelligible. I think it would have to be a relationship between, say, a horse and a horn. Or better yet, a narwhal and a horse. Yeah. <laughs> and then that, once we have this thought, this this fake thing that we've thought up, and then we can depict it. But there has to be something up here that it's an imitation of. This is why, um, <clears throat> did you know that if you're dreaming, uh, you never see a face in a dream that you haven't seen in reality? Your mind is incapable of inventing new faces? Really? I didn't know that. You can lose a dream and say you can get I can't, so it's fine. Unfortunately. Um, Neat. Well, that makes sense, though. Yeah. Um, I can't invent the text. Though. Yeah, because dreaming, Plato understood this, dreaming is entirely imagination. It's entirely imitations of things. It's reflections of reality in odd ways. Reading things is generally a kind of thought. You're having to relate letters together to figure out what words they represent and then figure out what those words represent in reality. It's a complex process and it's a miracle any of us figure it out by age five or six. Or start to figure it out. But it's this imitation that Plato emphasizes, this imitation that we see going forward into the allegory of the cave. Because the cave, the allegory, will trace this line straight up, step by step. Each part of the cave, each thing in the cave and then outside of the cave, if you've read this already, um, each part of it is represented by one of these stages and then different parts upon it. All right. So, Today, we're moving on from um, the two analogies that he presents, that Plato presents in book six, so the lion and the sun, and we're moving on to the, the bigger and more robust analogy that it presents in book seven uh, that he dedicates a lot of time talking about and that subsequent scholars have dedicated um, rainforests worth of pages to discussing, um, and that is the allegory of the cave. We're going to be looking at it in a particular, in the particular context of, of knowledge and of coming to knowledge and of ethically coming to knowledge rather than the specifics of, say, a political way of looking at it or um, various different ways of interpreting it because this is one of the most open to interpretation passages in the Republic, possibly second to the Ring of Gyges, which we've, we discussed some time ago. So last time we did watch uh, the animated version, and I did stop that to point something out, that there was that flaw there. But we remember this, this sort of path out of the cave. And as I was pointing out, that path out of the cave, that moving from being a prisoner and seeing only shadows of real things, gradually seeing that they are shadows of things, and then gradually seeing that those things that they're shadows of are just imitations of things outside the cave, 
and that the light of the cave is like an imitation of the sun in the sky and all of this, right? This layered imitation. What does that sound like? Layers of imitation, things imitating other things. Yeah. In fact, the reason I put these so close next to each other is that you can trace um, our ascent out of the cave as our ascent up the line. And in fact, each segment of the line corresponds really closely to a location, so to speak, in the allegorical cave. Um, maybe it's worth noting that this is actually a classical painting, but that it's, that it's kind of made jokingly. There's, there's some additions that you might have noticed. Um, part of that is just for comedy's sake. Part of it is because, I mean, there's something to the idea that the puppets and the puppeteers are something like mass media figures. And we'll take a look at that as we, as we get to that stage. So that's, it, it is something to keep in mind. Because there is this element, if you recall, this is the point where I had to stop in the, middle of the, uh, in, the, in the middle of the animated version and point out, well, there is this option to join the manipulators knowing what you now know, having stood up. All right, so, shortly reviewing. These people, our prisoners down in the cave, are seeing nothing but shadows on the cave wall and are hearing echoes and thinking that that's the realest thing that there is. What do the shadows represent? Images? Yes. Images of what? Objects. Yeah, so images of real particular things, right? Okay, so with the shadows, all people know, representing images, um, what might be an analogy for this? What is something that we um, ordinary, ordinarily deal with in the realm of images that this might bring to mind? You know? um, well, the way I see it is like, um, like the way you use like the broadcast symbols, like mm -hmm. the CNN, um, Fox. It's kind of like us watching it like, like we're the prisoners watching TV, and that's like what we see on TV is kind of like what it's like in the real world. It's kind of like it, but yeah. Um, the broadcasters, uh, they show us what they want to see, not like what might actually be out there. So that's our shadow. Yeah, so it's manipulated images, right? Images of something are always displayed in a particular way for particular purposes, right? This will apply to any given, let's say, depiction of anything or a story of anything. And this is, in a sense, well, I was about to say innately deceptive. That's not quite fair. It's innately unreal. There's something less real about images of things than about real things. And it's not just that they're two-dimensional and made of pixels. It's that they are, in an important sense, an imperfect imitation. And that'll apply at every level of this. Um, I have a volunteer. OK, can you come up here and uh, draw a triangle on the board? This is going to be great. Oh, yeah? OK, have fun. All right. <laughs> Nailed it already, right? It's not bad. It's not bad. It's not but um, it's not good either. <laughs> no, sure. Why? What's what's bad about that triangle? It's not perfect. It, there's wonky sides to it. We don't have a wonky side. Um, well, not quite. Maybe not that wonky. Um, it's this That's uh. Wish it, I wish he'd drawn it bigger so we could have made fun of it better, but still. <laughs> See? The size isn't everything. Yeah, so it could have been bigger, so it would have been a better illustration, and it would have served our purposes better, if nothing else, had it been somewhat larger. It would have been easier for us to examine it. Right, there's all sorts of things that are wrong with this triangle. What would, somebody else, what would you need to, put to draw a better triangle? A ruler. Okay. Want to? Me? Yeah. Sure. All right, come on up. Draw a better triangle for us. There we go. <coughs>
See, that's much better. But, no problem. But, so this is a pretty good triangle. But it's still not perfect. What, what's wrong? What's wrong with your triangle here? You had a good look at it while you were drawing it. So tell us what, what you did. What went wrong with your ruler triangle? Was like angled. The ruler was a bit angled. It wasn't a great ruler. It's okay. Um, the corners are. This corner is a bit open. So there's a bit of a problem there. The angles should ideally touch. Um, right? there, there's a little warp here that's probably due to the ruler. So there's issues, right? Even this better drawn triangle isn't ideal, right? It's not quite right. All right. Uh, what about what about this triangle? Is it? What do you mean, too long? It's just not proportional. You're right, it's curvy. But there's something more true about it, right? Now, even if the math doesn't work, because right, it doesn't, if you measured it, it wouldn't work. Guaranteed. Um, in fact, I could guarantee that about any triangle you could draw that the math wouldn't work, but we'll get to that. The point is that this is a better representation of at least one kind of triangle. Even if it's drawn imperfectly, it is in a sense a better representation. Why would that be? Because has, I guess, um, mathematical theorems behind it. Yes, so, so we know what the relationships are. We know the mathematics behind it. We know what that's telling us. Uh, is something more true and more real than three lines that are pretty close to a perfect triangle. Yes? Does that mean triangles are only theoretical, or...? Depends on what you mean exactly by theoretical. Now that's... that's you can't that's, make an actual proper triangle. It's yeah. only a mathematical triangle. Um, computer, I think. Ah! How about that one? How's that? It's an image of a triangle. What do you mean? I mean, it's just a depiction of a type of triangle. True. You that a triangle is two-dimensional. Well, triangles are supposed to be two-dimensional, right? It's not just that, like, the pipe was, that showed up as two-dimensional, like, compared to, you know, compared to our real three-dimensional physical one, right? There's a substantial difference, but triangles, by definition, have two dimensions. So it's, it seems... Pretty good. Right, what about? How about that? Describes all triangles of a certain sort. That's true of any triangle with one angle being 90 degrees. Okay. What does that say? Uh, for a right triangle, triangle ABC, A squared plus B squared plus C squared, Pythagorean theorem. Okay? So we're scaling up. Now, Going back to our computer-drawn triangle, it's supposed to be perfect, right? What's wrong with this? The lines. The lines. What about the lines? And then, so it's, and what is it? It's like, you see like, yeah. So the lines aren't quite right. That's not going to work, is it? Can't. Yeah. No, it's Bing. <laughs> 
I apologize. Chrome isn't working today. And like it, one I, line is thicker than you. Yeah, so that's an issue, right? This line is thicker than the other. What is the what are the dimensions of a line, mathematically speaking? Anyone know the, the measurements of a line? Say we have a line that is one yard long. What are the three dimensions of a line? You made a gesture. <laughs> it's one dimension. So what so what do you mean? A line is what any okay, any shape we can we can put in Euclidean space we can give three dimensions to. What about a line that is one yard long? It's one dimensional. Meaning there's only one dimension. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you can't make it three. three so suppose we're looking at this thing. This is uh, this is thirty six inches by two inches by an eighth of an inch? quarter inch, let's say. Okay, so I've given you three dimensions for this object. It's placed in Euclidean space. What about a line? What are the three dimensions of a line? Of a line that a line segment, let's say, that's 36 inches long. What are the three dimensions of a line? Of a 36 inch long line. You mean like length? Yeah, what's the length, width, and height of a line? 30, 36, 36. Yeah, that's one. By There's 36, two more. By 36? That's a cube. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see where you're going, but no. I'm not very good at math. Yes, thank you. It's 36 inches by zero inches by zero inches, oh. right? The dimensions of a line, because a line only has one dimension in space, I mean, that's what a line is. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know you didn't. I'm using it as an example. So. I'm not marking anybody off for not getting that. Um, so a line, the dimensions of a line, one, its length is, say, 36 inches. I'd have to zoom out a little bit. But its width is supposed to be zero. That appears to be about one. We have a problem. That isn't a line. What if you take the negative space inside the line? Ah, so this delineates a triangle, say. OK. <laughs> then we run into another problem, which is pixels. Right. No matter how well you draw a line, for instance, this inner edge is going to be imperfect. If for, only, if for no other reason than the resolution of our projector, right. or the resolution of your writing tool, say. Further, our angles will never be right because our lines won't be right. Because our lines are dimensional, our angles won't be quite correct. Any drawn triangle is not going to properly measure up to our formulas about triangles. Therefore, it is impossible to draw a triangle. Are you saying, are you saying like the mathematical part of the triangle is more perfect than an actual triangle? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, because, right, how do I know that this triangle is better than that triangle? You can measure it. So I can measure it, right? You can measure the angles and figure out which is closer to adding up to 180 degrees. I can examine the particular parts of it. Something to note, by the way, there's a reason that, um, I think back to the books, um, where Plato talks about the education for the, for the philosophers. And he lists algebra and geometry separately. Does anyone know why? Why those are separate subjects and not like side by side with each other? One of them is shapes and one of them is numbers. Yep, true. But typically we, we do like a year of algebra, a year of geometry, and then we apply our, our algebra to our geometry and then back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the algebra is like it's a problem solving. Like we, we have to do one side of one thing, you do another side of another thing. Yeah, we do that with geometry. We just but it's like more focused like on shapes rather than on algebra. It's like I might say the same. Like, I mean, like the concept. I mean, that's why probably algebra is taught before um, because the concept is brought over in geometry, but it's more focused like on shapes. It is now, but I'll also note that Plato has us learn geometry first. 
Mm. Weird. Um, that's a, this is actually an, an historical question, so that wasn't fair. Um, it's because um, before, roughly speaking, the Renaissance, geometry and algebra were unrelated disciplines within mass mathematics. Right? We didn't have formulas for geometric shapes. So geometry was done by not manipulating numbers which represent shapes, but by manipulating shapes. So shapes are, for Plato, real abstract objects, not just a mathematical representation. So this is just as much of a representation as this. This is closer to perfect, but it isn't perfect. Because it only represents a particular kind of triangle. Triangularity, what it is for something to be a triangle, is how we know that this is a better triangle than that. We have a standard by which we can judge these things. We can say that this, the bigger one here, is closer to being a perfect triangle than our smaller one. And that's because we know certain things about how triangles have to be set up. And if we were instead to say that a particular triangle, say, is more real than the form of a triangle or the concept of a triangle, Right? If we were to say that particular ones are more real, we'd run into the problem of judging the concept based upon the particulars. And that can't work. For example, if we have, say, if I had everyone in here draw a triangle on the board, if I were to even give you measurements to draw a triangle on the board, everyone draw an equilateral triangle with five inch sides, say. I gave everyone measuring equipment to do this properly. Okay, great. They would all be different. They would all have certain things in common, but the problem is no one of them would be perfect. So what do we judge them based upon? Do we say the ones that are the outliers don't fit the pattern are incorrect? That's hard to say because the best one could perfectly well be an outlier. It probably would be. So we see the issue. We need something like abstract concepts in order to judge particular things, in order to say this is a good example of this particular thing. And so this is why we have objects of understanding, so forms or concepts, being the most real. And then moving down to relations or mathematical descriptions then moving down to particular objects, particular things, and then down to images of those particular things. Okay. So back to our cave. We have, our, we have our shadows on the wall that are imitations of particular real, so to speak, object. And those are manipulations, right? So if I were to say, if I say draw a triangle, what you're doing is you're imitating, in this case, a relationship, or you're instantiating something. You're making a particular example that looks like your idea of something. I need one more volunteer. This one's hard. Okay. Okay. You haven't done it yet. All right. <laughs> no, uh, actually much harder. You have to draw a chicken. <laughs> or something. Pick an animal. Draw us an animal. Cats are relatively easy, that's true. Chickens are, there's a way of, there's a particular technique to drawing poorly drawn chickens. But that works, the hand thing. So pick an animal and draw us an animal on the board. Snakes are relatively easy, too. This is my one. This is my worm. <laughs> Cats, a butterfly is easy. Yeah. Well, let her do. Let her, let her decide. Sandal cream. The 
Anteater? No. No. Horse? No. Oh. It doesn't have a tail. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's an elephant. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so we have an elephant on the board. Thank you. <laughs> that, that, was, that was great. Um, so thank you, right? So we have an elephant on the board. That is an image of a real elephant, right? When you were drawing this, you were picturing an elephant in your head, presumably, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And you were trying to imitate that idea, that thought, or I guess that real elephant, presumably, that you've seen. You were trying to imitate that and saying, okay, what does this look like? I'm going to depict it on the board. And it happened imperfectly, right? That, that's not a perfect drawing of an elephant. Now even, say, oops, what am I zoomed out? Here's one. Even that, right? That's closer. It's closer to reality. But it's still an image. Did you actually get a real elephant? I, I always, every year, I think about bringing my cats for this, for this lecture, but... There would be no way to prevent them from screaming for the entire rest of the class. So, that's fine. They don't like people. Um, anyway, unfortunately. Plus, people might be allergic to them. That's possible, too. I'd have to keep them up here enclosed. Or don't want to deal with it. Uh, it's too much trouble. In any case, right, so to draw something like an elephant, what you're doing is you're making an imitation of something real. You're making some imitation for the sake of depicting something, for the sake of showing something to somebody. That's what's happening with our shadows, our images on the cave wall. Somebody is taking what they think to be real, what they take to be something actually existing, and they're making an imitation of it to show it to other people. This is also what we do when we communicate in just about any way about particular things. Right? So when we talk about elephants, someone describe an elephant for me. Gray. Okay, it's a gray. Big large. Big gray mammal with a trunk. Okay, good enough. Right. Big gray mammal with a trunk. Fair enough. Got it. Right. That's a description of an elephant. Right. That is, in a sense, an image. Because what it's doing is you're trying to put an image into somebody's mind. You're trying to portray something. But it's in imitation of reality, and it imperfectly imitates reality. And even if you have a phenomenal description of an elephant, it's still less real than a real one, clearly. And even if it's a better description than any picture we might have, it's still a description. It still indicates a particular real world thing. Okay. So our prisoners can then get up, they turn around, and what do they see? Their shadows. Well, they're already looking at their shadows. Oh. They turn around, they see the fire. Right? Yeah. They see the fire. They see puppets. They see things that kind of look like the things that they're used to um, that are being held up in front of a fire. Does anybody have this? Oh, question? Yeah. How are they learning to speak? Like, so, like, when we. That's a huge they, question. I was just wondering, like, when were they taking us prisoners? And how can, if they were, like, taking us, like, ah. like, cause, like Okay, so let's uh, let's modify the example because that's 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 a point that Plato doesn't even touch oh. for very good reason. Right? He doesn't want to address it. He just wants to say they've always been like this. This is all they've experienced. How do they communicate? Kind of talking to each other, and they just hear the echoes of the person's voice next to them. So they assume it's coming from the shadow on the wall instead of the person next to them, right? that kind of thing. So maybe an updated example is the Matrix. So you're plugged into, from birth, you're plugged into some interactive virtual reality, right? That's what this is imitating, right? And then the signals that are going into your brain are like the puppets. The, the, the signals that are being manipulated by the machines or whatever, right? That kind of thing. The real world outside is like the outside of the cave. This is something like, uh, actually, it's... it's Apparently, from what I've heard, teaching the cave before the Matrix came out like blew everyone's minds. At this point, everyone has seen the movie, so it's less, less dramatic. But 
He does provide a good example, right? A good illustration that's, I guess, a little bit more plausible. Because you're right. When did they, when were they imprisoned? Did they not have any experiences beforehand? Right. There's all sorts of problems. But it's an analogy, it's a story, and it's to illustrate a particular point. So our prisoner gets up, turns around, and sees this fire and sees these puppets. All right, what does the fire represent? The sun. Mm. Yeah. Light sources, right? Light, the things that enable us to see things, both real particular objects and images. Because it's, this, it's the fire in the cave that allows for, one, allows us to see the puppets, and then allows the images to be cast. So this... This whole cave area is this part of the line, our sensible part of the line. If you want to get really precise, this is the floor of the cave, this is the wall, this is the puppets and the puppeteers, and this is the fire, which represents images of things, real things, um, the act of imitation, say, and then light sources, what enables us to sense things. Right. So if you want to get deep into the analysis, you can do what that. What do you mean when you say puppets? Oh, like <laughs> the, the things that our puppeteers are holding up. So in this case, it's oh. depicted as like news sources or whatever. But um, in the story, it's, it's puppets of things, like, like a statue of a horse that you hold up before the, before the, uh, before the fire. Or like, you know, I, I hold up a pipe, and that is what we see, right, the, the shadow. So it's the physical things that if you stand up and you turn around and you look near the fire, you'll see these actual physical things that are different from the images that they're casting. Mm -hmm. Can't the people in the cave like feel each other's presence? Like sure they can't turn their heads. They know there's other people there. There's no With them issue. or like behind them. Um, who? Because they know each other. They know that this person knows that this person's here. Okay. Right. And then what they see each other as, as, as Plato understands it, or as, as Plato depicts it, as, uh, they see each other's shadows on the cave wall. And they associate the shadow with the real person. Maybe an example of this is, uh, does anyone have, uh, have a friend you've never met who you're just friends with online? OK, any of those friends have profile pictures that aren't actually pictures of them? Okay, if you were to meet that person in real life and you were to see them and they were to introduce themselves, it would be hard to recognize them, right? Because you're used to seeing them as some image, well, not the actual how them. Much you've interacted with them. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying you couldn't recognize them, yeah. right? You probably could, but it would take a little bit and it would be strange. Wait, do you mean like the profile picture of being them in a, like portrayed in a different way or like an actual, like just different picture? Either way. Right. Either way, it can work. Right. So if it's a cartoon avatar, say, like, then that's especially that's especially weird. You're going to run into a real person instead of like a drawing of a person. Wait, did you not Gandalf? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, a friend of mine, uh, for example, a friend of mine on Facebook who I'd never met in person, um, he had a, his profile picture was was Luke Skywalker for like three or four years, mm -hmm. and then he changed it to an actual picture of him, and he bears a slight resemblance to like 1970s Mark Hamill. So I was like, wait a minute, did you? Oh, so that's what he looks like. OK, right? So there's this shift. So we're, we're, sh we're shifting from seeing images of things, things that depict something, to the actual thing depicted, even if it's depicted imperfectly. Did you have something else? I'll say on whenever you communicate someone that you don't actually physically see, your brain mm -hmm. automatically like, has a, a certain image of like, their voice and like, their, the way they talk and all that. So when you actually see them, like, you're very like, shocked because your image and your, your, like your brain is completely different. Yeah, so books based, or movies based on books. Yeah. That, that's a thing. The worst. <laughs> yeah, the worst. But that just illust that illustrates this point. That's not exactly the kind of thing he's talking about. But um, this is an illustration of the kind of thing that he's saying, right? So he's, he's pointing to the fact that there are depictions of things. And what they're depictions of look significantly different. So if the prisoner were to stand up and turn around and see the statue of a horse, say, 
it would take a minute to say, oh, that's the thing that's casting that shadow. I showed you guys a picture of a narwhal on Tuesday. If you saw one in the ocean, it would take you a second to say, wait, is that, is that, did that whale have a horn? Oh, it must be a narwhal, right? So there takes a moment for there to be a connection. Even if you're very familiar with the images of something, it takes a moment for there to be a real, making that real connection to the actual particular thing. We can take, we can follow this road up as well. So once, <coughs> once a prisoner gets up and sees that there are these objects that are casting the shadows, there are things that these are images of, they have two options. They keep going. They can realize that, oh, these are images of these things. Well, these things are more real than this, but they're different from me. They're different from these. So there might be something further so they can continue up and out of the cave. Because if you see, if you notice that there's something true about something that you didn't know before, a natural response is to say, oh, what more can I find out? What else can I discover about this? What else can I learn? I'm going to go further. And that represents climbing out of the cave into the sun. The other option is to say, hey, I've learned something new. That means that I will now be able to manipulate these images better than these people will be able to predict them. And so me being able to manipulate these things to cast the images that I want, I can get these people to believe what I want them to believe. And then maybe I can go back down and be better at, uh, he talks about predicting what images are gonna come up and that kind of stuff, right? So it can either provide a better understanding immediately of what's down here, or after some analysis maybe, and then allow you to manipulate the images, or it can be an impetus to go up, seek more understanding, seek a deeper, further, more abstract understanding The person who stays here is something like uh, something like Thrasymachus, the sophist. The person who understands something about what's true, understands something about how people are deceived about things, and then uses that knowledge to continue the deception. It doesn't particularly care about what's, what these things are images of. What matters is that he knows more than most people. Right, maybe let's put this in the first person. What matters is that I know more than most people. Hmm? The people who are casting the shadows, are they from like the outside world or were they once also in the cave? Presumably they were once also in the cave. <clears throat> and again, Plato's not super clear about this. But we can, we can assume that, I think, based on the fact that we, he gives our prisoner the option of joining these people. So presumably these people are the people who took that option. Something like that. And now, why are um, at the prisoners? Why are they strapped to like their their feet are shackled, their hands are shackled? Yeah. So they can't see what's really going on. So they can't turn around and see the fire. Or okay, but like, like, what's the purpose of them being down there? I was, I was just wondering mm -hmm. because I mean, obviously they're down there for a reason. But is it like that? They represent real people in real life. Oh, okay, so yeah. you just use because this whole thing is just. Like, yeah, okay. the whole thing's an analogy, right? It's an allegory. So what he's saying is, we are like, by default at least, we're like the prisoners in the cave. Okay. What we see is mostly images of things. Occasionally we might see a real thing, right? And the only thing that we notice about the real thing is, huh, that looks like that image of this thing that I've seen before. That's typical of most of us in most situations. So if you were to see something that you've only seen on TV before, you'd be like, oh, that's, I've seen that before. Or I've seen, I guess, or if you're being more precise, you'd say, I've seen pictures of that before. You wouldn't say, huh, what more can I learn about this thing? Maybe you would, but that's a very reflective attitude to take towards something. It's not typically how we interact with things. Ordinarily, we just turn back around and look back at the images and say, huh, I saw the real one, that's neat. So something further, it is these, the statues, the things that are being manipulated, 
What do those represent? In the analogy, what do those represent? Beliefs. About what? Belief, belief is how we know about these kinds of things, whatever these kinds of things are, and how we interact with them. But what are they? What do these represent? Don't they just like represent ideas or rules that the puppeteers want to show? Mm -hmm. No. Um, the puppeteers are manipulating these things in order to portray, I hesitate to say ideas, but it, kind of, it conveys the point as long as we're not using very precise technical terms. Right? So in order to convey thoughts, in order to convey ideas, in order to convey some kind of message to the people. Propaganda? Yeah, it's used for propaganda. It's not just a narrative. Well, this is the narrative, right? What are they manipulating to form the narrative? Manipulating the truth, or? Well, they're imitating the truth, but in a fractured kind of way. Because uh, to, get, we're get, uh, to get ahead of myself really significantly, this is the truth. That imitates the truth. Mm -hmm. That allows this to be imitated and so cast something kind of like the truth, but only in a really low level sort of way. They're manipulating like particular real objects. There it is, right? The statues, the things that are casting the shadows are real things that are being manipulated. So how do you, for instance, how do you form a piece of propaganda? Change something else. So you change something in reality, right? You alter something in reality, and then you focus on it. You say, hey, look at this. A piece of propaganda isn't as, isn't as effective if you're just making an image from nothing. You're manipulating a real thing. You're saying, hey, look at this real thing that happened. Isn't this dangerous? For example, forewarning, slightly political, topical discussion. I apologize, I guess. Um, it's much more believable to say they're coming to take your guns if you can find somebody who's coming to take your guns and focus on them really, really intently. True or not, what you're doing is you're taking a real object, you're using that to depict an image. And this can go for any side of any kind of political or social movement. You're manipulating bits of reality in order to portray an image. Okay. So then the wire in the cave, we already went over, right? This is the sun, the light. This is what allows us to see things and allows us to be able to imitate things, right? be able to cast images, so to speak. But then the, the, the philosopher, the person who thinks further than these particular things. They exit the cave. What is that? What are they doing? Understanding? Almost. It's not what they're doing at first. They're moving from the particular, from the concrete, to the abstract. They're, instead of just thinking about this thing and that thing and this other thing, what they're doing is they're linking concepts together. They're linking things together into a conceptual framework. So it's instead of saying, oh, hey, a pipe, what you're saying is this thing is used for smoking tobacco. Tobacco can lead to lung cancer. Therefore, this could lead to lung cancer. Right? in certain uses, right? And then understanding what uses that might be and what's a, what's a beneficial or less beneficial use, et cetera, right? All of that building a framework of understanding. Mm -hmm. So is that like the relations, mathematics, thought? Yeah, like, right. So you're moving from belief to thought. From believing particular things about particular things, you're moving to thinking about the relationships between things. thinking how different things work together, relating things to one another. And that is, once you exit the cave, that is where he mentions reflections. 
of things, shadows of things outside the cave. Because that's where you start. So back into the sort of analogy world, the person down here is used to looking at images, used to looking at imitations of things. So when they exit the cave, the first thing they notice is what? It's not the tree. No. Really hard to look at the sun. The I don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. What is it? Like blinding of the light, like you can't really see. Yeah, so it's really hard to see, but once they start looking around, the first thing they're going to look at is the shadows, right? Yeah? Well, I was just going to say, like, the shadows. They're looking at shadows and images, mm -hmm. but the image is being projected by actual truth instead of the fake fire. Right. Right. This image outside the cave isn't being projected based on little little particular statues and things, right? It's being projected from real things. So what does that mean? Well, what we're looking at once we exit the cave are relationships between concepts or forms and particulars, or relations between different particulars. So sure, yeah, it's, so the first thing, if you, if you go outside and you're rubbing your eyes and you can't see anything because the sun is too bright, and you look around, the first thing you're going to notice is the shadows. And maybe your reflection, or reflections of things. Then you're going to start looking upwards a little bit. You're going to start seeing, oh, hey, that shadow of a tree is the shadow of a tree. Just like, oh, hey, this shadow of a puppet is a shadow of a puppet. You're going to start noticing the same kind of relationship as you go up into the conceptual or the intelligible realm outside the cave. So once you're out here and you start seeing the shadow of the tree and then the tree and then the shadow of a bird and then actually a bird, what you're seeing here analogically is this, this represents grasping concepts, understanding what things are in the abstract. Right? You've moved past our conceptual framework of linking different things together into, into networks of understanding. And then you've moved up to, OK, what are these things actually really? Or what are they really for? Or what, where do they really come from? Right? These, these broader questions about concepts. These concepts that you first abstracted out by looking at how things relate to one another. Then what you start looking at, okay, wait, how am I able to see these things? And you start carefully looking at the sun. It's hard to see. It's hard to look at. It's very difficult to actually get a grasp around what this thing is that's enabling me to see things. Just like in the cave, it was very hard to examine what it was that was allowing me to look at things. So examining what it is that allows me to see is not easy, because you need to see it. Seeing what allows you to see is very difficult. Similarly, understanding what allows us to understand is similarly difficult. But that's the logical next step. Understanding concepts, understanding forms, will then lead up to understanding, understanding. Understanding truth in the abstract. Not truth of this particular thing or that particular thing, but truth in general. What makes things true? What makes things real? And then ultimately, what makes things good? Which amounts to the same thing, right? What makes things good is that they're real, that they're true. Gradually, our person out here comes to understand this, comes to understand concepts, comes to understand how concepts relate to one another, comes to understand how concepts relate to particular things, and then comes to understand how those particular things have images formed of them, and what those images are of, and what that relationship is. And all of these interlinking things. Questions before I move on?
we, we see how this maps onto that, right? Okay. So then what, is, what does our person now outside the cave, what do they do next? Mm -hmm. They have to go back into the cave. Yeah, according to Plato. Why? Yeah, uh, say the other person is. Yeah. They know all these new things. They know the truth about reality. And so, they don't. Our people in the cave, the friends of the people who are outside now, have no idea that there's this world beyond what they're familiar with. So, our thinker, our philosopher, our person who has considered things, now sees it as an obligation to go back to these people and say, look, turn around. There's more to reality than images, images on the wall. Okay. Why did he say in the video, at one point he said, when you free the prisoners, at some point they're going to kill you? Yep. Why did he say that? For example, how did Socrates die? Execution. Yeah. Why did that happen? Because he's jerk. Yes. He was like but, trying to like portray like what almost like the purpose of life and people weren't accepted. So they're like because he was different. Like it's not just because he was different. Know, there's like, a, there's an element just of in that, general right? like because he was saying all these about things. Yeah, he was just saying outside the box what he thought were true and they wouldn't accept it. Yeah. So yeah. He went against what was already accepted by the society and the rulers. Very much so. So say this prisoner, this guy. He really knows his stuff when it comes to what shadows are popping up on the wall. Right? He really knows his stuff for the images. Let's say these people, they're really good at manipulating these, these statues. And some guy comes in and says, guys, none of this is important. All of this stuff that you focused your entire lives on and dedicated everything about yourself to, yeah, that, that's all pointless and you should, you should come and look at these real things that make all of the stuff that you understand trivial and obsolete and unimportant. Your uncle on Facebook, who you unfollowed, who's constantly posting about conspiracy theories. <laughs> I done it. I done yeah. It, I done it. Yeah. So, so you know, the, the people who seem crazy because they're not, let's say, operating within everyone else's paradigm. Okay. I sound like woke AF right now. Is that how <laughs> I say this? Um, I'm not trying to. I'm so sorry for saying. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, you get the point though, right? This, this, this sounds like, oh yeah, the, well, I mentioned the matrix as an example. And taking the red pill, that whole thing. That's kind of what's going on here, but you know, really, and not delusional, which is hard to tell, which is part of the problem, and part of why Socrates was executed. Because if everyone knows something, right, if everyone knows, something's true, and some other guy, some crazy old guy is coming around saying, well, for one, saying, oh no, all of this stuff that you think you know is incorrect, and here's why, and he won't stop bothering you about it, and he won't stop bothering the young folks about it, getting them to bother you about it, there's a good chance that you're going to either ignore him or kill him. Uh, what do you think in history that people started to Immediately. <coughs> There's just some people. They just grew up that. Um, yeah, so it began immediately, right? A lot of his students took him very seriously, clearly. Well, I'm talking about like the mass. Um, never? <laughs> I mean, he killed him. Yeah, right. And, you know. <laughs> talk about like down the line. I'm not talking about like who killed him. I'm talking about like. I mean, in, in, that's kind of what I mean, though. The point is, right, so most people, if we're taking this model, are still here. And most people, when their, their worldview is bothered, will be annoyed by it, and are annoyed by it, and ignore it, or react violently to it. That's still the case. And most people, let me put it this way. Most people are perfectly fine with an image of Socrates, but if you tell them what Socrates actually said, they'll be annoyed. 
because it's trying to disrupt with their ordinary their ordinary way of thinking. The ordinary way of thinking that you know particular real things are real. Yeah, we all think that. But hey, guess what? There are things that are more real than that, and things that are much more important than that. And you should really think about the more important things and stop dealing with the little particular things that you've literally dedicated your entire life to. So to answer your question more directly, right? We've never, we in general, everybody, have never really reconciled this idea. Um, this is a call to understanding things more deeply. Rather than just a, here's, here's something that happens to be true about the world, right? What we're saying is, here's a way of thinking that's very different from how you ordinarily think about ordinary things. And that you should think about this. You should think about things in this way. But thinking about things in that way, one, it's difficult. Two, it'll make you weird. And three, it'll make you less capable of doing the ordinary kind of thinking that we ordinarily do. Because remember, he talks about this, the, the philosopher coming back and speaking to the prisoners. And the prisoners, how do they react initially? No. They laughed. They laughed at him. Why is that? It's like, kidding me? Shut up. It's not just that. It's not just his ideas seem crazy. There's more to it. Yeah? They, they laughed at him because he was having a hard time understanding the fake images because he's so used and accustomed to the real images. Yeah. He hasn't been, his eyes haven't gotten accustomed to being back in the cave, and they laugh at him for it. Right. Because if you're usually thinking about purely abstract concepts, and when someone approaches you with a very, let's say, concrete, practical question, you're going to sound crazy and not appear not to know what you're talking about. Um, we see this in, well, maybe, maybe it's me. I see this, at least, in political discussions. Because I am a conceptual thinker, I think up here. When I'm presented with a political question, what I, what I sort of automatically do is I sit quietly for a moment, think about the concepts. And, and meanwhile, everyone's <coughs> like, yeah, that's not the question I asked. I asked, what should we do about gun violence? And you, here you are talking about abstract theory of, of personhood. And, and what? Why? It doesn't seem relevant. And it seems like I'm dodging the question. I'm evading the question because I don't know an answer to it. So this is a particular case of, of, of this kind of thing happening. This does clearly happen, right? So we, if we're used to thinking in one kind of way and somebody asks us a question about something else, we're lost. So getting into images in particular. Somebody asks, oh, what did you think of that movie? Pick one. What did you, eh, here's one. What did you think of the, uh, what did you think of the, um, the last Star Wars movie? And I start talking about abstract concepts that it instantiates and, sa and saying, oh, well, there was, there was really cool symbolism with the, with the confrontation at the end. I thought that was a great, uh, a great resolution to a character arc. And all of this, you know, this conceptual stuff. And you're like, that's not what I asked. And that's not what I wanted to hear. Right. I wanted to hear you say they ruined my Luke Skywalker. Right, that's, maybe I'm getting a little navel gazy here, but, but you get the point, right? So if I'm talking, if I'm used to thinking on, if you're used to thinking, let's say, on a level that has to do with forms and concepts and thoughts, and somebody asks you about particular things or images of things, and they're, asked, they're expecting an answer down on this level, and you provide something up here, you're going to sound dumb to them or you're gonna sound pretentious to them. And if you sound dumb, they're gonna laugh at you. If you sound pretentious, they're gonna be mad at you. If you insist upon your answer, then you're definitely gonna sound pretentious and you're definitely gonna get them mad at you. Okay. So, let's step, take a step back for one moment. Remembering that the person who leaves the cave is the philosopher, the person who examines more deeply and understands abstract concepts, 
And that that is the same person that, that Plato says should be ruling in the Calypolis, the just city. What does he say are the two roles of the rulers in the city? What are the two things the rulers should do? Provide wisdom. Well, that's the, that's the two things. Or by one. one. What? What? Or how? Or, or what? What uh, guidance also work? So wisdom and guidance. So that's well, that's actually a, an okay description of the dichotomy, but let's um, find a little more. Yeah, some sort of practical wisdom. Something like that, oh. right? So, <clears throat> so wisdom and guidance, or practical wisdom and theoretical wisdom, they have to one understand the truth, and two convey it to people and organized society, right? So they are knowers and they are rulers. They are outside of the cave and inside of the cave. They have this twofold obligation. Right? And so Plato will apply this, and this is, this is where we, we bring this, this political into the particular again. Because again, the whole political thing is really to tell you what you need to do particularly for an individual. <coughs> is to say that once you understand, understand in this sense, that you then have an obligation to, one, explain to others, and you have an obligation to form yourself according to that understanding. So it's not just you, you, you continue thinking and you continue to understand further things, but that you implement it. You implement it in your life and you implement it by explaining it to other people as well as you're capable of doing at least. So there's this obligation to come back into the cave even if they'll kill you for it, metaphorically or not. Probably metaphorically. Maybe a better example is maybe if, if they'll block you for it. Questions so far on what goes on here? Mm -hmm. It seems theoretical, but I don't really get how they would kill them because they're locked down. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that too. Um, and if they get out and they're unlocked, they could see the light for themselves. So. Yeah, so you're right, of course. It's all it's very, it's very theoretical. It's very flawed in its understanding, uh, in, its, in its kind of setup. But in working with the tools that he has, um, they would also be like emaciated and weak. And that's true too. Presumably they're, they're, they're eating. But that also yeah. provides its own problems. So, yeah, I don't know. In any case, yeah. There's, there's all sorts of issues with this. But there's something that we can take away from that. Right? There's something that we can, we can actually take from this. So you say, well, if they could stand up, then if they can stand up and turn around and see. What was the initial response of the person who stood up, turned around, and saw the fire? Ah, I'm turning back around, right? It's an action, it's an act of ignorance in the strictest sense, right? Uh, not just not knowing, but refusing to know. Because knowing is painful and disruptive to the things you already know about. And you know, this is typical of most people. Learning new things, especially learning new paradigms of knowledge, it, it's not, it's not easy, it's not comfortable, and it's incredibly disruptive to what you already know. It, it causes as many problems as it solves, especially in the short term. So uh, an, uh, an example of this might be, so, um, so in, in physical sciences, we have paradigm shifts every once in a while. So the people working on early quantum theory um, faced a lot of academic pushback. Why? Why? 
why would, why would fellow academics who presumably want to know true things have a significant problem with these people who are trying to discover new things? Mm -hmm. It would force them to have a paradigm shift. They have to think other than the ordinary way of thinking. Yeah, they'd have to shift the way they're thinking about things. Maybe a better example is relativistic physics from, from Newtonian physics. So they shift from, relativistic, from Newtonian physics to relativistic physics. It's not just that you're learning new things, but you're learning a new way of knowing things. And by learning that new way of knowing things, you're having to start roughly from step zero. And you're having to acknowledge that, hey, all of those things that we all knew, that everyone knew for 300 years, okay, I guess that was not all that, not as true as we thought it was. That it's not true of everything like we thought it was. And that's, that's dangerous. Because if, if, if a new discovery or what we might think is at least what we at least might think is a new discovery overturns what we already know then what what does that mean what do we know now what we knew before was wrong okay we what do we know positively correct nothing and that's not good right if we discover that what we knew before was wrong, and that's all we discover, suddenly we don't know anything anymore. If you discover that there's something more than the shadows, there's something more than images, or even something more than particular objects, then what do you know? To quote Socrates, all I know is that I know nothing. That was his mantra over and over. He would always say this. We mean it. It would mean that he really did know nothing, because all of this stuff, he knows it's untrue. But this stuff, one, it's hard to understand. Two, if he could understand it, he couldn't convince people of it. So he knows nothing. But that's more than everyone else. Because everyone else knows a bunch of false things, or thinks they know things that just happen to be false. Okay. What of a note? something to, to pick up on and to notice here. So this transition from inside the cave to outside the cave, or this transition from sensible to intelligible, this is, roughly speaking, a transition from sentient to sapient, if you're familiar with the terms. What does that mean? Instead of like just relying on your senses, you have to use consciousness and use your intellect. Yeah, this, this line, this light, is consciousness. There's a lot of work, I guess, especially in the modern context on this shift of what is consciousness, what does it mean for something to be conscious. And a lot of it has to do with self-reflection, but a lot of it has to do with abstraction or conceptualization. <clears throat> if you have pets, you can probably notice this. Um, why does, say, a dog have trouble with a familiar situation in a separate context? So your dog's used to going through a doggy door. You move to a new house. You put a doggy door in. They have to figure it out over again. Why? Habit. So sad. Habit? But, but what do you mean? Why? Let me ask a different question. Why don't we have similar problems? We can self-reflect. Kind of. Because we know that the, the doggy door in the example is just, just an exit. So if we move to another place, we know what an exit looks like. So we can still follow it. But a dog has to relearn the exit, because all it knows is that the first time it went through, that was an exit. They know that, well, it's not even this is an exit. They know what this particular thing does. They have, we can say in, Plato, in Plato's terms, they have beliefs about particular objects. Right? Why don't we encounter the same trouble when we encounter a door we've never seen before? Because we know the concept of the door. You know what doors are, right? Dogs don't know what doors are. They know what that door, they know that thing is a way to get from here to there. What they don't understand, and they can't understand because they can't understand in general, is that a door is a portal. A door is a way from point A to point B. And this particular thing is an example of a door. 
That involves concepts and that involves relationships between concepts and particulars. Consciousness is the, is the ability, one understanding of consciousness, I think Plato's understanding of consciousness, is our ability to conceptualize and apply those concepts to particulars. So we can abstract across a set of, of particulars to universal principles. The reason, I'm, the reason I don't have trouble relearning when my food dish moves from point A to point B is because I understand what food is, and I understand this, is, this kind of thing is the kind of thing that I eat, and this is the kind of place where I can eat it. Okay. So that's a, a way of at least of, of illustrating this difference, right? This is basic encounters with particular things. Right? And you can develop habits to do with these particular things. Right? I don't conceptualize or think about what I'm doing right now. I'm just taking a sip of coffee because it's in my hand and it's next to me. It's what I do. Right? I don't abstract away and think about you know, what's in here and anything like that. What I'm just doing is I'm, I'm interacting with a particular thing that I'm used to interacting with. Abstracting away from it is my ability to drink different liquids from different vessels without having to think about each instance. To understand the concept or the form of drinking. 